1887, one of the most well-known documented poltergeist cases began. The Great Amherst Poltergeist, located in Nova Scotia, Canada. So this story revolves, revolves around a young girl named Esther Cox, who lived in a house with her married sister, Olive Teed, her husband, Daniel, and their two young children, a brother and sister of Esther, and, yeah, and them. As did Daniel's brother, John Teed. So it was quite the packed house. There's, there's a lot of people living in this house. Everyone knew them as a good, hard-working people, Love God, praise God, hooray, kind of people. The events wouldn't begin until an attempted sexual assault on Esther. It was August 28th, 1887. 19-year-old Esther was on a drive carriage ride with a gentleman known as Bob McNeil, a local young man who was a shoemaker. But Esther did not know that this Bob McNeil fellow was a disturbed young man. Neighbors would say that he would skin cats, and after skinning them, watch them run around in pain until they died. During their carriage ride, their buggy ride, he pulled the buggy over, took out a revolver, and commanded her to get out of said buggy. Esther was trembling with fear, terrified. What was he going to do to her? Probably had something sinister in mind for her. He commanded her to get on the ground, or he would shoot her where she stood. What she thought was a nice date with a local young man could have turned into a much worse night until he heard another buggy in the distance approaching. So what did he do? He put the revolver away and drove her back to her place. These events would shake her to her very core. And after this incident, this is where things started to get a little bit weird in the, in the teed house. Esther, for the next few days, became distant in the house, which was fair with what had happened to her but no one knew why she was acting this way but they left her alone allowing her to cry herself to sleep in her room waiting and hoping she would get over whatever it was that was bugging her within a month of the attack weird events began to unfold in the teed cottage esther was sleeping one night in the bed with her sister jane when she was awoken by something a noise coming from underneath the bed they figured it was just a mouse. So they got up and they searched for it. But they found nothing. So they went back to sleep. The next night, the same sound came from underneath the bed. Esther was spooked, so she woke her sister up. And they both searched for whatever this sound was. They pulled out a box that was underneath the bed, waited for the mouse to appear, but nothing. No mouse came out of this box. All of a sudden, the box jumped up into the air before falling over. They were shocked at what happened. The box jumped again into the air. They screamed for their brother-in-law, Daniel. He listened to their story and laughed at how absurd it sounded. He took the box, put the lid back on, and pushed it back under the bed. But the sister couldn't shake what they had witnessed. A heaviness lingered in the air, a feeling something bad was going to happen. After that night, things began to get much, much worse in this little cottage. Not just for Esther, but for all people involved. They all began to hear unexplained knocking, banging, and unidentified muffled voices during the night. And on one occasion, Esther screamed for Jane to wake up, yelling, I'm dying! I'm dying! Jane woke up, looked over to her sister, who was standing in the room. She turned the lamp on, and her hair stood on end at what she saw. Her sister's face, Esther's face, was red as blood. Her eyes looked like they were about to pop out of their sockets. And her hands were grasping the back of the chair so tight that her nails and fingers dug into the wood. Jane alerted the household as to what was happening. They tried to get her to go back to bed, but she kept saying, I am swelling up and shall certainly burst. I know I shall. They watched in horror as her skin began to swell up, becoming as hot as fire, but she was as pale as death. She continued to scream as if death was on the, the doorstep. The family at this point were frightened and not sure what to do. It was at this moment in all the craziness that a loud sound boomed through the house as if lightning had struck it. They drew back the shutters to look outside but there was no such weather to produce a lightning strike. Again, another boom shook the house. Esther at this point started to look normal again. The cause of this was unknown. This was not natural, whatever it was, and started 
a series of unheard of events not known to this world. Now, we're going to get into some stuff. By the end of this, I'd like to hear you guys' theories of what you think this might be. Poltergeist, haunting, whatever. Let me know, okay? Banging. Knockings could be heard all around the house. Four nights later, she suffered another similar attack, where she swelled up like a balloon. And she went to lay down. As she did, the sheets of the bed flew off the bed into the corner as if somebody had grabbed the sheets and ripped them off the bed. Her sister tried putting them back on the bed, and for a second time, they flew off the bed as if someone pulled them off. Then a pillowcase was torn and thrown at Daniel's face. They had to hold Esther down. The family members had to sit on one side of the bed and hold down the other side so the sheets would not fly off the bed. So Daniel Teed called over the family doctor, Dr. Uh, Carwright, I believe that's how you say his name. They wanted him there just in case more attacks uh, took place, you know, in case she sw uh, swelled up again. And to assess what was wrong with Esther. While there, he witnessed some very weird events. He saw the pillow she was laying on move, fly out from underneath her head and go back underneath and then straighten out as if someone had adjusted the pillow for her. He had a theory, so he grabbed the pillow and he tried to hold it from being flung out from underneath her head. Whatever this force was, was too strong and ripped the pillow from his hands. This frightened him. He heard a strange scraping sound one night, like someone was carving into the wood or into the wall. Looking up, he saw the words, Esther Cox, you are mine to kill, form in the plaster. The plaster broke off from the wall and flew and landed at the doctor's feet. More banging and objects began to fly around the room. This lasted for two hours, and then the house fell silent, as if it stopped. Now, this doctor had no scientific evidence of what was actually going on. When we returned to the next evening, he admitted that something might be afflicting Esther. You know, something far beyond medical understanding. Esther was showing signs of nervousness, so something was eating at her. The doctor could tell. So the doctor gave her a very powerful sedative, because there wasn't much else he could do. She took the sedative, and she dozed off and fell asleep. Now, you would think, oh, probably helped things, but this actually made things a lot worse. Noises began again, this time louder than ever. It sounded like someone was on the roof, trying to pound their way through the top of the roof using a sledgehammer. It shook the walls, and if you walked outside, it could be heard down the street, 200 yards away. This would continue for three weeks, with the doctor attending to her three times a day. The family claimed whatever this entity was could hear them, even responded to the questions when they asked it questions. Daniel asked at one point, how many people are in this room? And what followed was five knocks. Five people were in that room at that time, and Esther's face was buried in a pillow, terrified. They knew a few things, that this was tied to Esther. Whenever she was in the house, it occurred. Sound, swelling, all the weird stuff. But when she left, it all stopped. So something was tied to her, an entity, a ghost, or something. In December, Esther was diagnosed with diphtheria. And during this time, small fires began to break out all around the house, including one in the cellar. Luckily, everyone was okay. Now, at this point, the doctor and family had no idea about the attempted sexual assault, and one night, she went into some sort of trance. Now, I don't know if she was high from painkillers or whatever. She started to explain everything uh, that happened to her with Bob McNeil. The weird thing is that Bob McNeil, who worked with Daniel and John Teed, had not been seen since that night he attempted to do whatever it was he was going to do to her. He had not shown up for work and paid off his landlady and left. Where had he gone? No one was sure. Maybe it was shame for what he did. Scared about people finding out. Maybe he just left town. January 1879, Esther moved in with another local family. Due to the ghost stating if she did not leave, he would set fire to the loft and burn them all to death. But these manifestations around her followed and continued and were witnessed by many people. Some believe her herself was responsible for this phenomena. She was definitely met with some hostility. She moved around a few times, but no matter where she went, it followed her. What were some of these violent attacks against Esther from this ghost, poltergeist, or whatever it was? She was slapped, pricked, scratched, and even stabbed in the back with a knife. News spread of what was happening, and in March, Esther spent some time in St. John, New Brunswick, where she was investigated by some local gentlemen with an interest in science. Yay, science! By now, several distinct spirits were apparently associated with Esther, 
and communicating with onlookers via knockings and poundings. Bob Nickel was the original ghost, claimed to have been a shoemaker in life, and others identify themselves as Peter Cox, a relative of Esther's, and Maggie Fisher. This gentleman concluded that Esther and her family were not faking this, and that what happened between her and McNeil made her some sort of battery. So her herself were causing small bolts of lightning to come off her body and producing these loud sounds, these knockings, or these booms. After the visit to St. John's, Esther spent some time with the Van Ambergs, her friends with a peaceful farm near Amherst, and then returned to the Teats Cottage in the summer of 1879, whereupon the phenomenon broke out again. It was at this point that Walter Hubble, an actor with an interest in psychic phenomena, arrived, attracted by publicity surrounding this case, moved into the Teats Cottage as a lodger to investigate the phenomena. Hubble spent some weeks with Esther and her family and reported having personally witnessed flying and moving objects, fires, and objects appearing from nowhere. This included silverware, pins and needles spontaneously flying through the air and burning matches inexplicably dropping from the ceiling, and claimed that he saw phenomena occur even when Esther herself was in full view and obviously unaccounted with them. In addition, Esther was attacked by pins and needles that appeared in midair and flung themselves at her. When she fled the house for a nearby church, the banging sound had followed her, and when she fled to a barn, the falling matches that appeared from nowhere, ignited the hay within the barn. After this, Esther was imprisoned for a month as an arsonist, despite her and others' instances that spirits were to blame for the fires. In prison, her torments lessened, and sometimes after she was released from prison and married, they ended altogether. In 1888, Walter Hubble published uh, his diary of events in the Esther house, later expanded into a popular book selling at least 55,000 copies about what has happened. As to what might have caused the poltergeist activity, experts on such phenomena have suggested that the trauma of Esther's uh, rape might have either attracted a violent spirit or enabled Esther's mind to produce the poltergeist effects or to produce an actual poltergeist. But if her mind was producing these effects, how did other people around her also notice these things? Was it by sheer mind power that they were created? Now let's not rule out something else here that she may I've had some sort of psychic ability. Maybe this trauma that she had had unlocked something within her mind. And she started to produce these sounds, abilities to move objects, start fires with her minds, produce objects out of thin air. Kind of like the battery theory, but more of a telekinetic thing. What are your thoughts on this case? Let me know. That was the great Amherst Poltergeist. If you haven't heard of it, now you have. Curious to know what you guys' thoughts on this.